You're so inspired to get on the van, yes? I could feel it, I can feel it. So we left off two weeks ago and it was carried forward by Debbie last week about what it means to be a Unitarian, a Universalist and a Unitarian Universalist. Now some folks may be feeling like, why do we have to know? Why are we using all these old history books about Unitarian Universalism? I didn't come to a history class. Reverend Wilson, what are we doing? And the intention of this and the hope of this is that we do not move alone, that we are part of a long stream. We are part of a long history. We are a theological people. And when I said that a couple of weeks ago, I wanted us to reclaim that word, that we can say yes to be Unitarian Universalist, as Debbie said, doesn't mean I don't believe in anything or I can believe in anything. It actually means something really important. And it comes from a lineage of people who took risks to believe something radical. And they left off a lot of work for us to do. Now when uh, we spoke about Unitarianism, we spoke about both the beauties and the limits of Boston Unitarianism. And I was telling you all these sweet and beautiful things that they brought into what we believe today. That they believe that Jesus being human was actually a symbol to us of our own divinity. That God was not out there, but the divine was right here which was a radical thing to say at the time. And not only that, but they said the Bible is not the only scripture that shows what God reveals on the earth. Revelation, or what is revealed, is actually always happening in our lived experiences. So you are yourself God's revelation, which at that time was so radical to say. It was such a powerful thing to say that we brought our lives to the story that we ourselves were revealing what the world meant as it was unfolding. What we said was the limit of that was that incredible, beautiful gift that emerged from Boston was also a gift rooted in the experiences of white men of privilege. So it was limited. And it was based on their experience of the world, which is one kind of experience of the world. And unfortunately, the work they left off for us is a whole lot of individualism. Do you hear it in that? If I have God in me, do I really need you? <laughs> and if I am God's revelation, do I need anybody else's revelation? And if I am really good at resisting authority, whether it be a God that I think is punishing me or a king that I think is corrupt, and if I push back authority, but I create a religion where I am my own authority, then what we've created is a people who all think they are the own authority. Do you see what that can do? is if we all think that we have to be the powerful, clear experts, we lost something. Something was incomplete. So that's where we went into some what ifs. And I suggest a compassionate critique of our ancestors. Compassionate because yes, there are ancestors. You have to claim your kin. You have to claim your kin. And also they lived in a context that was their context critique because they knew better. They knew better. And we know that they knew better because other people of the time were doing better. So when William Ellery Channing said, actually, we need to stop slavery and his Unitarian Church of people who actually were part of the slave trade exiled him, there were other people who were also saying and doing the same thing in resisting slavery and pushing for abolition. So we know our ancestors could have done better. The job that we have is this. We are not far off from where they were. We are not far off from where they were. When we look back at them and say, it's so obvious. Of course they should have ended that. Why didn't they just do it? 
what we are also facing is that we are a people who live at a time where there are more cages than ever. So when we look back at them and say, why didn't they do it? And when we look back at them and say, what would have helped them do it better? We are not doing it just to critique them. We are doing it so that we can do it now. We are doing it because we need their lessons in our lives today. What's unique, though, about this is that universalism, bless it, leaves off a bit where Unitarianism leaves off. So universalism, we heard the story of John Murray on the boat ending in Jersey. John Murray shows up in Jersey. John Murray is one of the first in his area to say, maybe we don't all go to hell. Maybe we don't. But for Murray, that was eventually we all don't go to hell. You might have a purgatory moment when you die. It might happen. But at some point, God is reconciled with you because God's love is so big. And now if you hear me and you're struggling with some of the language I'm using, I'll use the words God, I'll use the word salvation. And for some of us in the room, that might send a tingle up your spine. And for others, the words might be welcome. So in our pluralism here, suggesting that all those people are in the room now, I invite you to translate into the word that makes sense for you. But in John Murray's time, it was a radical thing to say that we're not all gonna end up in hell. Now people came after him. Caleb Rich was a poor farmer. He was out in the fields, he worked with his family, and he had all these visions and dreams and tensions in his body because he couldn't understand why a God would send him to hell. And he also used to say, am I selfish if I wanna be saved just because I'm afraid of hell? Is it real love of God if I'm just afraid? And so Caleb was this little radical rabble rouser, preacher prophet, and he moved through this time, but he said, it's not eventual, God saves you immediately. Why wait? <laughs> God loves you immediately. Now, what I want us to notice about these two stories is different from our Unitarian uh, ancestors, is that this was the experience of white folks in poverty. So this particular group of white people was experiencing a totally economic different reality than the Unitarians in Boston. And so they asked different questions. When the same people are in the room, we lose our theology. We are made less when we don't have more experiences of God right up here in the room. But so for these white folks who were experiencing poverty, they had different concerns. They were asking different questions. Now, who would come ultimately to kind of give us our universalist manifesto is Hosea Ballou. Now, Hosea wrote this incredible book called The Treaties on Atonement. And in that book, Hosea systematically takes down what he believes to be a doctrine of the, only the elect being saved. So his doctrine of universal salvation says this, in a world where there is an infinite amount of love, sin is finite. Sin is like this in the possibility of our collective love. Our love can be so much more powerful than that in the form of God or otherwise. He was being told by the people of the time, humanity needs to be punished for their sin. Christ takes on this sin through sacrifice. Baloo said no. Christ's death didn't give us punishment. Christ's death broke open hearts. Christ's death opened up hearts and more love is actually possible. No more punishment is needed. It's not what we need. We are already reconciled with an, a love that is so big and so infinite. Anything else is small and insignificant. So there's a contemporary theologian, Nancy Ladd, who writes in this book, The Good News. She describes that uh, that's an incomplete sometimes understanding of the divine. It wasn't that humans are 
so good and so pure that they should be saved. It's that the possibility of love is so great that there's nothing you could do that would be so bad to make you fall outside of it. That you could be ultimately embraced by it. That even as imperfect humans who mess up and fuddle up and sing weird and do things that we regret and push each other away and cause harm, that even still there is the possibility of love, particularly in the expression of accountability for that harm. So what does that mean for us as a, as a community of faith? Well, for them, it meant that salvation, if you're not worried about where you go when you die, for them, then it means you don't need to be worried about that. You only need to be worried about right here. If there's not somewhere we need to be worried about getting it right so that we don't burn for ages and ages, then our energy is freed, and in fact, our energy is required to be in the present to be in the here and now, to honor and care for each other, to build the kingdom here, because there's no other place to do it. There's no other place to go. That's a lot of theology. That's a lot of theology, but it could mean some really important things to us now in very specific ways. If you are a person of faith, who believes that what is the most sacred thing is right here and now, and that what is right here and now is holy, and that is what is right here and right now is the ongoing revelation of all the beauty of our planet. If you believe that, you will act in a very different way. And if you believe that, if you believe that what is here and now matters, then what we have to do is focus on what is in front of us. I wanna say this theology means something very specific to us as we celebrate this incredible possibility. That I remember when we first walked with the PMT through that gorgeous building, I was just like, oh my God, I touched all the flowers when I was there. I was just touching them. And I remember us all scheming secretly, where would we put the pulpit? Where would I get to preach from, right? And oh, could we have lights there? And Kim's gonna sing, and Susan's gonna play, and the choir's gonna sing. Oh my God, the parties we're gonna have, the people who will come just flooding in through the doors. The moment that we open up our shop, we were so excited because we could see the vision we were longing for and I'm right there. What I want to encourage us is that as each of us holds that there's a certain salvation in that building, that we will carry ourselves as we are now right into that building. We will carry ourselves the harms we have not tended, the love that we have withheld, the ways we have felt stuck and not unstuck ourselves, the grief we have not shared, the commitment we have not made, we will carry all of it right into our salvation. So there is a holy job to be done among us in these coming months, to be a people who know that salvation is right here and right now. And to ask ourselves as we continue, if I were to act like we were already in that gorgeous building, would I act any differently here? May we be in that way together. Blessed be. We have one more fun song for you. Your words are printed. And we invite you into the blessed imperfect. <laughs> and I encourage you to stand as you feel willing and able. 
and to be guided by our incredible musicians as we sing this song, What the World Needs Now, and maybe risk even letting yourself be heard by the people around you. <laughs> as if you're already in that gorgeous building. Let's sing together.